This is a Bulldog Radio Podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Most Valuable Sports Podcast. Brandon Worth here. Along back is my co-host, Joe. Good to see you again, buddy. It's good to be back. Had a little bit of a break. Uh, I got with some family over the weekend, but it's nice to be back in the studio and back to podcasting. Absolutely. And with us, special guest, sports reporter for the Ferris State Torch, Dylan Ryder is with us. Dylan, welcome. Thank you for having me. Glad Hello. to have you on. We are looking for more guests, so reach out to us, follow us at the MVSP on Instagram, Twitter, and subscribe to all the podcast platforms, including YouTube now, and you may be the next guest on the show. You'll just have to wait and see. And we have some, we've had some fun guests on the show. I look forward to having more each and every week. Me too. It's a lot of fun having new people in the in the studio, being able to have some more people sit across from me than Brandon Worth. So it's going to be a good time. But Brandon, we got a pretty good show on the dock for today. Is that a, is that a dock towards me? No, I'm not saying that as bad. Oh, Joe. Man, we probably had like 80 episodes where it's just been you and me. And, you know, I'm not saying that's no that's fun. True. I mean, we have fun, but like. I'm just messing with you. No, that's true, up the relationship a little bit, you know. Absolutely. Grow the network. Yeah, exactly. Grow the network. But into the Ferris State Sports Report, we go. Ferris Hockey got the split. Almost. Almost got the full sweep. But we settle for the split. Friday, 4-3 loss to Bowling Green and what was a tough game I mean I know I only came back in the second period after um, coming back from the track meet which we'll talk about in just a few moments but I mean we came back I mean we were down early huge second period three goals to take the lead and then just didn't have enough time and Bowling Green comes back with two in the third period to top us and take away three points I mean this was just a really tough game because I mean Second period, it looked like we were just firing on all cylinders, and then, and definitely was not that in the third period. Everything just seemed like to fell apart defensively. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that that game was rough. Um, covering it, uh, they they had that second period that that was learning from your first period, but uh, after that, it, it just fell apart. They their their penalty kill. Was was it fell apart in the third period? Their power play overall all, overall was just not good. Daniel said it himself, just not good. Um, and that's kind of what they need going forward is to take advantage of those opportunities if they want to jump in the standings whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, two for four was Bowling Green on the power play. That'd be two for four on us for the kill. I mean, fifty percent. I mean, that's. It's it's not it's not great in hockey standards. I mean, I, yeah, it's one out of every two. But I mean, then you think about it, it's one out of every two. Like you're gonna have multiple power plays in each and every game, and especially the fact that, I mean, just the amount of infractions. I believe it was nine in this game altogether. So you know that those are gonna create opportunities, and when you just can't you just can't capitalize. And I mean, that's just been a big thing for us. Is not only the, I mean, the penalty kill. I mean, when we're on it, I mean, and that was definitely something we'll talk about in the in the next game on Saturday where it changed a little bit but I mean when this team seems like when we find ourselves in the hole a lot like there's just times where we get out of position a little bit it's almost like we're too anticipatory is that a is that an English word in the Merriam-Webster dictionary anticipatory sure that's that's the word I'll try to use but you know what I mean very reactive especially when we're running a four-man box or even a mm-hmm. three-man triangle that we had to do at one point, and heck, even a two-person at one point. Uh, but I think there was just a lot of times where we would be very very reactive to the first pass, and we'd find ourselves a little out of position. I mean, yeah, it's hard when you got a man up on the other side, but there was just times where we found ourselves in, in a rough spot. They'd get an open look, and, I mean, they just got they just got a great shot on net. So, I mean, credit to them because, I mean, they capitalized on their opportunities. But, I mean, that's the one thing that I think we need to have better is overall, I mean, win more face-offs is definitely one thing that I've noticed and definitely got to make sure that we're in the right position on the penalty kill. Because like Saturday night, when we are in those positions, we do great. For sure. I mean, I wasn't there, so I mean, I can't really talk too much about it. Cause I don't. I mean, I saw the highlights, but obviously, I didn't see like the nitty gritty, everything else going on. Kind of like so I could really be of some analysis, kind of aid to you guys. But just kind of looking at the box score, it looks just like that we've let a lot of opportunities go, and I think we gave them a lot more opportunities. I mean, when we're on the when we're on the penalty kill for about ten minutes, or for 
you know, 10 minutes, that's going to be a rough one, especially when we're, you know, when we struggle with staying, uh, you know, now I don't say healthy, but more just in shape on those later times. So when you're on the four on five, it really takes away a lot of gas uh, from you. So I think that's the one thing that we definitely got to work on. I mean, second game obviously did a little bit better with the win, but you know, it just sucks because we definitely, this was definitely a very gettable sweep. Could have definitely won, you know, five straight at this point and really done well for the CCHA standings. But I mean, what else are you going to do other than just get ready for the next game? I mean, it's been a fair theme throughout the entire season is just giving up a little bit late um, Mm -hmm. or giving it up. Um, Yeah, we're not saying we're not saying the guys are giving up whatsoever. It's just we've struggled in the third period. Yeah, third period kind of rough. When you're two in the hole coming into a second period and you're able to rip off three straight goals and take the lead heading into the third, and then you get sloppy, you take two penalties in the third, which you cannot afford against a team like Bowling Green, um, and they will make you pay. They will mm-hmm. burn you, and that's what happened. Two power play goals to take the lead in the third period, uh, and it was just too late for the Bulldogs to get another spark going right at the end. Um, it's unfortunate that it's been going on the entire season, um, but it, obviously they, they learned from that in the next game and came back a, a little harder. Yeah, that was, a sick, that was a sick OT goal in the second game. Oh, and yeah. Marshall has split the guy. Absolutely. Fantastic winner on Saturday's game where we ended up getting the 2-1 win and the extra two points in that one. I mean, it was a super a super fun game as far as just like the tenseness throughout the entirety of the game. I know me and Dylan were talking about how physical the game was. Um, yeah, there were 19 penalties in this game. Jeez. Yeah, it was rough. A couple game misconducts. It was a very interesting game because it was super physical and it never let up the entirety of the game. I mean, both teams came out pretty chippy and it stayed that way all night long. And it was just uh, the intensity, of, especially of what you said, Joe, about the standings. And I mean, um, Dylan has definitely analyzed those. And he'll go over those in a minute here about how big some of these games are coming up, especially the fact that like we're within one point of Lake State and Northern to potentially jump into the top five spot. And I mean, based off of some of the, the, the schedule we have coming up for some mm-hmm. of the other teams that are above there. I mean, some of those teams are going to be reachable, like Bowling Green. So, uh, I mean, definitely when you look at the fact that we were one of five uh, on the power play, but we held Bowling Green to one of four, I mean, that's a definite improvement from the night before. But, I mean, the biggest thing that I saw was just the fact of, like, we did, we locked it down in the third period because then again, I mean, we scored in the second, right? And that's been, that's been the MO as we get it. We'll start off a little slow, get it back in the second. But what happens in the third? And, I mean, we give up that power play goal, and it's like, uh-oh, here we go again type of up. But then the guys locked it down really well. They did a great job defensively and, and found themselves in good positions to make stops. So that was huge. And just the fact of, yeah, Marshall Moyes, he was due for that one. I mean, that was a definite... Definitely yeah, a big been a, time. It's been a while since uh, he's gotten on the scorecard. Yeah, he's been one of our, our most predominant scorers in, you know, on this roster. And just the fact that he had gone so long without putting one in the net. I mean, just the fact that everyone that was talking about it is, yeah, he's due. He's he's yeah. too talented of a goal scorer to not have scored so, so long in all these many games. But good to see him get the OT winner. And it's good to see the Donks stealing two points. It would have mm-hmm. loved to have been three. But, hey, yeah. we'll take two. Bowling Green had 41 minutes of penalty. Yeah. That's yes. ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Overall, that's that. incredible. Eleven infractions for forty-one minutes. Yes, because they had two g- game misconducts. Yeah, that's for. Rid- that's twenty by what itself, right there. I well, mean, the one guy got contact to the head. That's crazy. Yeah, he yeah. mm-hmm. get ejected or no? It was a contact, or there was so it was a contact. In he shoved him head first into like shoved him like, shoved? from behind. Oh, I can't remember who mm, it was off the top. of my I head. I think it was Michaelia. I think it oh, yeah. might have been Wait, yeah. Which one? And uh. Well, I think it was it would have Justin been Brendan because I Brendan? think Justin was scratched yeah, from it that been, game. Oh yeah. Like, so yeah, Brendan yeah it was a na- like he he pushed him straight that man head first into the board. So yeah. it w- it was not pretty. It was a scary moment cuz do that. Yeah. So but he, down, was he, down down? For, he was down for a while. He was he was oh. writhing on the ice for a good couple minutes while they were it was yeah, it was a hard scene. Yeah. I think they won that cuz I think 
good way to come back, I guess, from that. That's he, rough. Yeah, it was it was a scary moment, but I mean, he got back up, and I mean, he got an assist in this game. So I mean, he he really contributed on the back end. So that's um, awesome. I mean, we saw Logan Stein back in that, and yeah, he was great. Thirty two of thirty three in the save count. And I mean, it's really good to see him back in his his prominent or prominent performance. Just because I mean, we've seen Noah Giesbrecht a lot, and he's been kind of the hot man. But just being able to see Logan get back in there and put together a pretty good performance has to give him some confidence moving forward. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's good for him to be able to get this win, especially be able to hold it out because there's so many times where it's been close like this, where it's been one one two two or something like that, and he gets that overtime and he kind of gets held out to dry. And a lot of people look at you know Logan for losing the game and stuff, but like. There's so many times where he's been able to have like, you know, a 95% save percentage. It's just he gets left out to dry on those. You know, one time he's across the ice or he gets screened a little bit, and the defense might not be doing their job. And of course, I mean, when he gets to that point, it gets a little bit, you know, disheartening for him. But it's good that he's able to, you know, hold it out, get the get the win after sitting on the bench for a couple times, letting Gearsbreck do his thing. But you know, it's good for him, especially you know, being young, being so good and stuff like that. But you guys want to hear some scores from around the CCHA this weekend? Absolutely, Joe. Give us your scoreboard. Lake Superior State took on Northern, the two teams that were right behind. They came out really hot, firing 6-1 in the first game, but didn't get the sweep split with them 2-1 in the second game. So kind of what we had. Hey, had. that's good for us. So, yeah, pretty Keep good them close. for us. Uh, Minnesota St- State took on the budding Arizona State Sun Devils program. They got the sweep 4-2 and then 5-3. Uh, Bemidji State then fell both times to Michigan Tech. That's pretty surprising. They're on a little bit of a four-game skid. Hate to see that. Ferris does that to people. Hate Michigan to Tech see won it. 5-2 and then 5-2 both times. And, of course, we won. Or we got the split. So. <laughs> and, and of we, course, we, we won. Yeah, yeah. That's all that matters. Yeah. That's interesting, though. I mean, Bemidji State, I'll tell you what. Like, that team, like, came in, like, they were a dominant team. And then we ended up getting to sweep at their place. They haven't played well since. I'm pretty I'm, sure they're, like, top 10 at the start of the season. Yeah. Right? That's, oh, yeah. They're, that's like, 11 good, 10. Uh, that's a good hockey team. They've been getting uh, votes for, I think, top 20. Mm-hmm. They, they have a couple of them. It's well, been yeah. going down, obviously. Well, I yeah. think the, well, when I looked at the standings, like, at the start of the year, like, Every other than St. Thomas, like every single Minnesota hockey program was like in the top twenty-five. Yeah, yeah. it's Minnesota. I mean, yeah, yeah it, I mean the they have hockey. the state of hockey though. The but ice freezes outside from like you know October to March, basically. Their entire mm-hmm. state is a practice rink. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, land at ten thousand likes. Yeah, know? that's just the way it is. But no, I mean, it's definitely crazy to see how like the the standings have evolved in some of these teams. I mean, like Bemidji State, I would still consider a top twenty-five team. I don't know exactly where they are in the rankings at this moment, but I mean, they're eleven to nine in the CCHA. I mean, that just shows how tough this conference really is. Because I mean, across the board, you have Michigan Tech is eleven and five in conference play. They're second. If you come back down to us, we're technically in seventh right now. We're eight and twelve. That's literally only a three game difference as far as wins are concerned. Mm-hmm. So that just give that just attests to how great this hockey conference is. But I mean, the I'll, you take the rankings though with a grain of salt because I think Lake Superior was also in the reserve spot at one point during the season, and yeah, they've only won eight games in the mm-hmm. conference. So yeah, they did beat Minnesota State though. Well, kind of. <laughs> not really, but yeah, kind of. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, that, that Minnesota State team was not healthy when they played them. Mm-hmm. That was the interior of the joke. But, I mean... It's rivalry week, though, for for a certain two teams. Yeah, Arguably the heatest rivalry in D1 hockey. Yes. Michigan Tech and Northern Michigan going to be at the MAC. Yes. That one's going to be crazy. I'm looking forward to that. That's happening tomorrow, though. That is happening. It was supposed to happen like a week ago, but then it got postponed. Yeah, it was. It's true. But a lot of good games coming up. We're on bye, so we will not be in action until next week. We're going up to the Sioux to play Lake State. So those are that's one of two winnable games right there, especially to flip. Sweet, and, baby. And potentially put in a scenario where we can now move up into the CCHA standings because, I mean, we would love to have home ice. To, for the playoffs and I mean it is reachable it is it's a little out there but it is reachable yeah um <laughs> there's a lot of volatility so with Ferris State in seventh right now uh they can easily jump uh Lake Superior State uh Northern Michigan as uh Lake Superior State and Ferris are tied with uh yeah and I think they're only ahead just based off of the the goals 
the goal category, I believe, if that's the difference, right? 76 to 71. Sure. Yeah. That yeah. Is. But, I mean, difference, it's still not close because we've allowed a lot more goals. So, but, I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> getting getting shelled by uh, Minnesota State didn't help. No, that do- yeah. that never helps. That's not 14, at all. That's 14 to 1. That's yeah. a 13 goal differential right there. But, uh, bypass no. the point. Bypass the point. Yeah, that's if, ridiculous. If Ferris can go up to the Sioux and get a sweep on Lake Superior, then that'll put us ahead in the standings. Um, but it can also have us jump Northern Michigan in yeah. one mm-hmm. go, especially with the rivalry, because you know that it's it's pro- there's a good chance that 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 series ends if in a split. If they're at the MAC, I think it's going to probably be. Yeah, I mean it's only one. I think it's only one game. I think if I saw that right, but because I think they played the first one, but then Michigan Tech won that one. I think. Yeah. Unless it's both that happened later on this week, but if it's at the MAC, Michigan yes. Tech's uh, yes, Michigan Tech's crowd is probably. I mean, if you know fair sports, we are very vocal, and uh, the fans do not. <laughs> the fans do not mind uh, shouting some expletives at the refs, and Michigan Tech is basically the same thing. Hey, so Bowling Green was pretty ruthless Mac, over the weekend too. I'm not gonna just sit back and let that flow by. That yeah, needs to be true. pointed out. They but, were uh, awful. Michigan Tech, especially when they're at the MAC and they, they got that student section rolling, and they got their season ticket holders there. Like that place is crazy. And I think that's going to be tough for Northern Michigan because, you know, they have a great fan base. And, I mean, it's not super far that they have to go. I think it's only like a two-hour drive between the two of them. But still, like, those two teams, like, no love lost. They hate each other. Like, it's almost as bad as Grand Valley Fair State. Like, that's basically the – It's up there. That's like the magnitude of the rivalry. So, it's going to be a good one. I'm pretty excited. I'm probably going to watch that one on Flow Hockey. So It's going to be a good one. But all we're saying, it's possible. But we got to get two. Michigan Tech's got to win. No, or in Lake, we got sweep Lake State in two yes. weeks. Yes, that's the job. Let's go do it. Two weeks, ooh, Friday, ooh, Saturday. Ooh. Even though most fans will not travel up to watch, but you can, as Joe mentioned, watch on Flow, Flow Hockey TV. That's true. Watch all the Bulldog action. But well, you got to pay for that. So <laughs> true. But it is for all D one college hockey, though. That so. is true, though. So I mean, so you, you could watch everything. Michigan, Michigan State, hypothetically. That is true. So hey, it could be worth it. I mean, I feel like I'm now. I'm balling on a budget. I'm, I'm, I'm balling hockey now. I'm balling on a budget though. So Doing like, an ad. Yeah, on a like here. yeah, just a casual promo, casual promo. But anyway, moving over now to the Hardwood Fair State at Wayne State in Detroit. Got the sweep between the men's and the women's. We'll start on the men's side. A 75 to 60 victory over the Warriors, who really are still bouncing back. I mean, they had that coaching change earlier in the season, and uh-huh. they've just really been struggling since right now. But I mean, they played us tough. Only a 33 to 30 first half. I mean, we definitely did not shoot the ball that well in the first half. I mean, we still were like 41 percent from three, but 61 per. Or excuse me. 36 percent 36.1 that's where i got my am i like dyslexia messed up right there yeah. but um the i mean definitely a much better second half i mean we took care of the basketball a little bit better um but i mean overall i mean we played def- we played our defense very well uh and wayne state really wasn't able to hit from outside so you got to credit our defense from that and i mean really it's just win one move on to the next game i mean that's really all this team's doing now we've beaten conference opponents 11 straight times and we're not looking to slow down at any point yeah, for sure. I mean, I, sadly, I wasn't at this game, I or especially at the Thursday game, too. I wasn't being able to make any of those. But, you know, it's great to see that we're still rolling in the GLIAC. I think it's really going to set us up well. I mean, especially with us being kind of in the second half now, uh, officially being able to play these games. And I mean, a 15-point win over Wayne State. Like, Wayne State's usually, like, I mean, they're near the lower part of the GLIAC, but they're a team that usually is pretty solid from three, and they're a team that can, you know, really – really throw a wrench in you, especially at home. They're a team that, you know, regardless of the record, you got to be wary of them. And I think for us to now be 11-0, it's going to be a good uh, spot for us to go against Davenport. We haven't played them yet so far this season, so I think they're going to be, you know, kind of the kickoff of, you know, an actual test. You know, I mean, they're going to be coming home, so it's not going to be too bad. Uh, but, you know, if we got guys who are able to, you know, fill it up, if we got Dorian Lee, I mean, Ethan, all those guys are able to really light it up. And coming off the bench, too, I think we're going to have enough depth to be able to defeat those guys. So coming especially to uh, Wink Arena, it's going to be solid. It's going to be rocking. It is Thursday, so, I mean, I'm not sure how many people are going to be there. I'm going to be there. Brandon, you're going to be there. It's going to be a good time. Hopefully, yeah. I mean, you might have something going on. But I have class, but we'll see how I mean, that goes. <laughs> I, mean, we, I mean, I have class, too, but. That's true, but hey, sometimes priorities. Hopefully no teachers are listening to this. Anyway. Yeah, hopefully um, Stack isn't tuning into this episode. (laughs) 
No, we'll be fine after that class. I have a 6 p.m. class. That's where you I have get... a 6 p.m. class? Yeah, that's where I get screwed. But right. that's, that's a whole other can of worms. We'll just bypass <laughs> that at the moment. But yeah, uh, one thing I did also notice, this game was really like stop, start, stop, slow. A lot of fouls, a lot of free throws. So, uh, I mean, you definitely like look at... Um, if you like were chance looking up on the scoring chart and you're like, whoa, these numbers look really weird. Because no, no, that's how slow the game was. There was just oh, not a whole lot of shots. There was a lot of fouls. It was very physical. But got the job done and that's the kind of the nice thing that i have noticed over like because i mean we're a really good free-flowing team that's one of the biggest things that has helped us with success and the prominence of the 17 18 team was being able to use um, especially the fast break the counter attack on the offensive side to get open mm-hmm. looks so we're used to playing at a really fast pace but just the fact that we still were able to get slowed down a little bit i mean credit to wayne state they slowed us down a little bit but we were still able to get back to that or get back to our playing style and still be able to succeed despite the really the the change in tempo and the change in speed and just the how the game went um not the basically what i'm trying to say we won in a in a pretty dominant fashion i mean 15 points is definitely one you can say yeah it was a pretty it was a pretty one-sided win Mm -hmm. but i mean you can still say like it wasn't the best style of play that we play at but we still got the w right what's the expression joe Sloppy, uh, uh, sloppy, sloppy, win. sloppy W is better than a clean L. Bingo. Exactly. So that's kind of how this game went. And, I mean, just the fact of it is we're 11 and 0, and that's all you can say about that. But Logan Ryan, 18 points, four boards in this one. Dorian and Louie, Walt Kelsey reached with 12 and 11. Lee had 14. Ben Davidson, 10 off the bench as well. Uh, Scholler, Jimmy Scholler, eight rebounds, two assists. He did not score a single point, but that's not his job. That's not in his job description. So Yeah, that's true. It'll be a little bit confusing on the box score, but Jimmy Scholler is an awesome player as well. Assist guy. Assist guy only. Assist guy first. And then sometimes those are the people that you need to make a team successful. Mm-hmm. And we got a quite a hefty little report to go for the scores from oh around boy. the GLIAC, especially since every team played on Thursday and Saturday. <laughs> Please so tell me the in, one team up. lost. It's Please ready tell to me go. the one team uh, lost. The one on team. Thursday, though, Wayne State did uh, get the W against Lake Superior State, so 68-60. to 60, They're able to split the weekend. Michigan Tech beat Northwood 89-48. to 48. Uh, We beat Saginaw Valley State 82-71 to 71 earlier on. Uh, Purdue Northwest then fell to Davenport 56-84. That's a big loss. Hate to see it. Uh, and then Parkside getting the W over Grand Valley. Yes! Grand Valley is falling apart 78 Let's to 67. Go. And Thank then you. on Saturday, the fi- or a couple days later, Northern Michigan gets the W against Northwood. They can't get a win over the weekend. 77 to 59. Uh, we beat Wayne State as we already mentioned earlier. 75 to 60. Saginaw Valley then picked up a W against Lake Superior State. 79 to 67. Clean W. Grand Valley bounced back. Pretty close one though. 89 to 80 against Purdue Northwest. And oh. then Parkside kept the train rolling. 95 to 73 victory over Davenport. And we got some pretty good games coming up later on that we'll talk about later on next episode. That's a slip up. For GV, that's a slip up. Yeah, that ain't good. Let eight, me tell against you Park, eight against Parkside, and then they lost to Northwest. Yeah, that ain't good. Or was it flip flop? One of the other. I mean, they still. Lost to, they lost to Northwest. Yes. And then, and then they only then beat, beat Parkside, Parkside by yes. like eight. That's a slip up. Okay. Ain't great. Let me tell you what. Woo. Not pretty. No, they're, I think, eight and three now. I mean, Yee. they're still second. I don't seven and four. Michigan Tech is eight and three. You know, not great for them. They lost it. to us, and they're really falling apart a little bit. Say oh. it, Joe. Huh? Anchor down, baby. Oh, Thank well. you. Anchor down. Yes, sir. Yeah, for sure. That's anyway, crazy. moving on over to the women's side, they also got the W this weekend. Revenge fashion down and Detroit. 73-65, the final score. This team beat us in one of, or not one of our finest performances oh, a couple weeks ago when they beat us. I believe it was 60-45. to Comeback season with a nice win. Uh, I definitely saw a lot of things from this game that we hadn't necessarily seen from this team in over the couple of the past games. I mean, we shot pretty, pretty darn well from three, 45%. Uh, hitting free throws was big in this game. 16 of 22, 72% overall. And that came in clutch, especially since, um, I mean, Wayne State, we knew, is a good rebounding team. They out-rebounded us in this one. But, I mean, really, looking down the stretch with, I mean, uh, such a close game that you saw a lot of good, or a lot of big-time playmakers show out. I mean, Zoe Anderson, definitely one of them. Two of two from three, eight points in the fourth quarter. Caden Blanchard also with eight points. I mean, those two really came in clutch in the final frame. So 
the fact that it is, I mean, now we're eight and four. Now we're climbing up the standings, and now we've over we've actually flipped over Wayne State, who's now seven and four in the GLIAC with this win. So that's a good win. I mean, for this program, and I mean, just the fact that this team has done so well in uh, opposing environments, I think, really speaks to the test. Because I mean, we know how great of a team they are at home, but I mean, getting some road wins has been big. I mean, this one certainly certainly is one of them. So I mean, and we didn't have a lot of we didn't have a lot of bench play in this game. Just how just how the game flowed, and I mean, we still we still got the job done. So you got to give credit to the starters for, uh, I mean, really playing a fantastic game. Yeah, for sure. It's pretty sick. I mean, we, I'm, like I said, wasn't there, so I can't really give too much of a statistical or like an analytical approach to it. But, I mean, looking at it, I mean, it's a good bounce back game. Uh, we love to see it, especially going into, I mean, Davenport coming up uh, this weekend, or especially on Thursday uh, later on this week. It's going to be a pretty solid. And, I mean, when you look at the box score, too, it's pretty, it's pretty nice to see a lot of people are – or a lot of girls are able to, you know, get on the scoreboard and get some get some solid points on there. I mean, you know, five or four people over double digits and then kind of clean up the scraps a little bit throughout the throughout the bench too. I mean, it's great to see, especially when <clears throat> you're getting on a later part of the season, you're able to get, you know, your your cert your certified buckets that are able to, you know, fill it up a little bit. But to see that some people on the bench are able to put it in as well is really great to see, especially when you get to those times where you might have some of your starters go down. You might need your starters to take a little bit of a load management and take a game off. Uh, But regardless, it's great to see. Yeah, and I mean, definitely, if you were to ask anybody like who the hottest player on this team was going into this game, it was going to be Adrian Anderson. She had been leading the the team in scoring last couple of games. She only had five points in this game, and the rest of the starters responded in a big way. Zoe Anderson yeah, had twenty, Chloe Adoni had thirteen points, Kamala, Mallory McCartney with thirteen point seven rebounds, Kane Blanchard had eleven, eight of them, as I mentioned in the fourth quarter. So I mean, really, the production has been great across the board, and I mean, we're definitely going to see those games where everyone's going to be needed. Everyone's going to be needed to step up so uh this is a good stepping stone right we had a couple just a couple of a stretch uh, a couple games over over this road stretch i can't talk today that have really given us some fits but now the just ability to get out on the road and get the win i think just really really gives us that bump up uh, that we need confidence wise to go up especially going into the second time around now that we're gonna have to play some of those tougher teams on the road once again so uh, definitely really good to see, and we're going to see this team back in action, as Joe mentioned, on Thursday, as well as the men's team going to take it on Davenport. And then Saturday is the big one. Bring GV down to Wink. Let him have it. Yes, so that, I'm those, really sad I'm not going to be able to make that game. Oh, I yeah. will be there, but I might not be there Thursday game, so maybe we'll, maybe we'll flip-flop. We'll yeah, see what goes on. Now, now our minds are clicking right there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also Monday, Davenport's going to play the men's team now for the rescheduled game. So we're going to yeah, play Davenport twice in four days. <clears throat> Very yeah, that's going to be crazy. Very interesting. Yeah. Some but, scores from around the GLIAC for the women's side? Yes, send it. All right, let's get wrapped in and get ready to go. Uh, Wayne State, they topped Lake Superior State 75-50, to 50, able to get some of their first wins on the women's side. Uh, Northwood Timberwolves, d- big dog in town, 10-point uh, victory over Michigan Tech Huskies, 91-81. to 81. Grand Valley Park, the boat on the park side. Rangers, 67-34, to 34, quick little 30-burger win for them. <laughs> Uh, Purdue Northwest beat Davenport 68 to 55. Uh, Northwood on Saturday top uh, Northern Michigan 78 to 75. They hosted them. Uh, Saginaw Valley then uh, had to travel all the way up to the Sioux to take on Lake Superior State. Didn't matter. They also dropped a quick little 30 piece on them 73 to 43. Ooh. Parkside then got the redemption against Davenport the uh, same day 67 66. That was a close one. Great, uh, great to see. And then Grand Valley State. Kept up with their reputation of being the top of the GLIAC. Only one loss on the year, but that didn't matter against the pride of Purdue Northwest. 64-40 to 40 final score. Those are your scores from around the GLIAC. There it is. A lot of, a lot of interesting uh, results that we're starting to see now that teams are starting to play second time around. You can see, ooh, here come the coaching adjustments. Here, co- here comes that revenge tour. So definitely fun to see. But finally, out with the Ferris State Sports Report, the track team was at the Bill Klinger Classic down in our friends in Allendale. Friends, of course, mean quotation marks um, behind enemy lines, you would say. But had some pretty good performances. Uh, I mean, I think overall the team was, uh, I think, pleased. Uh, there was some definitely some um, some notable performances. Uh, I think overall, I think we have. There's still a lot to. There's a lot of good potential with this team. I know personally, a lot of the, a lot of my teammates are really 
really looking to excel and get those breakout performances that we haven't quite had yet, but that's good because we need those in the conference championships coming up at the end of the month of February. But some notable results here. Um, two top or top three individuals in the field events. Claudia Wilkinson was fifth in the high jump. Uh, Emma Stefan fifth and Brianna Copley sixth in the shot put or weight throw and shot put respectively. Excuse me. Uh, Hannah Brock finished seventh in the mile with a 519. Amelia Toplinski seventh in the 5K with a 1921 PR for her. Congrats. Uh, Paige Dietering tenth in the 5K as well as Claudia Wilkinson eleventh in the 60 hurdles. Um, the 4x4 team ended up finishing 10th out of, I think, was a, I want to say a 20 or 20. It was There was so many relay teams. It was kind of ridiculous by the end of the night. But, I mean, I guess that's just how the meet went. But um, uh, Ray Lee finished 5th in the 60. Uh, Randall Cook 5th in the 400. Dakota Simpson 8th in that event as well. Donis Harris came 10th in the 3K with an 832. We could be talking to him on the show. He has this little sneak peek for you. Um, and Casey Bowman uh, got 12th with a 50. 1548 in the 5K, and our men's 4x4 finished fifth overall with a 330, a season best. So congrats to them. Uh, we'll be back for the big meet and possibly my return. I'm looking forward to it. Got that state circled on my calendar February 11th. Very excited. And really going to be a fun time for track coming up in the month of February because it's game time. Got Big Meat, which is going to be a huge, huge test for us. And then on Tune Up, and then obviously GLIAC Championships, where trophies are won. But you can find all that information out at FerrisStateBulldogs.com. But we'll take a quick break. When we come back, NFL Talk. Did Tom Brady really retire? And how the Chiefs threw away their chance for a Super Bowl. Stay tuned. Podcasting is fun. Being able to chat with your friends on air about all of your favorite topics, whether it's entertainment, news, politics, sports, or culture. That can be fun. What's not so fun? Getting your podcast out there for people to hear. Luckily, that's what Anchor.fm is best at. Be able to create, distribute, and monetize your podcast all for free, including recording options and exclusive customization tools that you can even do on your phone. For more information to start your own podcast today, visit Anchor.fm. That's Anchor.fm. Now hopping in, we're going to talk about the NFL Conference Championships that happened over the weekend. It was a win-win for me. Happy to see it. I don't got to see Jackson Mahomes and uh, whatever her name is. <laughs> Brittany. Uh, and, yeah, Brittany <laughs> in, the, in the Super Bowl. You know, Joe Shiesty and Money McPherson got the dub over, the, over them. I mean, I'll see Stafford in the Super Bowl as well. It's going to be a great one for me. But, boys, we'll start off with the first one. Bengals and Chiefs, 27-24. Bengals. Money McPherson is too cold. Joe Burrow, Joe Shiesty, he's able to lead them. Jamar Chase as well. Guys, that was a crazy game. OT, I stand corrected. I guess when you lose the coin toss, you won't always lose the game. But that's incredible to see. Bengals got the win. What was your guys' thoughts on it? Hey, the coin flip doesn't always bring out There's the never, outcome. The not thing always. Is though, the thing is, though, not no, always. No, I mean, team, no team has won two overtimes in the postseason, though. So yeah. I was like, when I saw that, I was like, mm, no. two overtimes oh. in a row or? Two, uh, or just, two overtimes just, in the postseason. Oh, yeah. Oof. So, like, in a row. winning one and one in the next round, then you go in, they, they would again, definitely but. lose. That's what that's what they're saying. You don't win yeah. two in a row. Yeah, I see what you're saying. But, yeah, I mean, overall, this game was certainly looked like it was going to be lopsided early. And, I mean, because I, I mean, really, it just comes down to what was what was Kansas City doing at the what end of the happened, half? What's happened to the second half for them, dude? That, like, that, that, I honestly think that that play – Definitely would have been the catalyst that kind of sent them in their down spiral. Because mm-hmm. I mean, you look at where they were. I mean, you're inside. You're inside the ten, with like I don't know what is it like 15, 10 seconds left. I mean, you run the first play, you throw it in the dirt. It's like okay, take three. You're gonna be up twenty seven to what was it ten at that point, or was it? Yeah, it was ten. I was right. Twenty seven ten going into the half, and you just scored. You have the momentum, and you're going to get the ball. But they, they they got a little greedy. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, they got a little too cute with the play calls. And, I mean, even Mahomes said that he threw with, to Hill and that was not going to be their first read. And, I mean, that, that really just that gave it away. And that gave the Bengals so much momentum because then after that moment, punt, punt, pick, punt, punt, and then they get the field goal to send it to overtime, and it's pick compared to 
yeah, touchdown, a touchdown, a touchdown, and then it would have could have been another touchdown, mm-hmm. but it could, should have been a field goal. But what was it actually? Goose egg. Nothing. And what was the final score, by the way? 27-24. Oh. I was on a TikTok. So they would have won the game at that point. I was on TikTok at halftime, and uh, there was a video that came up, and it was like, Patrick Mahomes is like solidified himself as like one of the best quarterback or like the best quarterback in the game three Oops. tds like already 200 yards in the first half and i commented out it's like don't speak too soon there big hoss yeah and then um, i came back to the video <laughs> after the game's lost and every like i had like i think it's like 2,000 likes on it or something like that Ooh. but it was funny though because he was just like the chiefs are gonna win it and i was like dude i don't know about that joe burrow is pretty nasty with it but that's crazy i mean that's the thing though can't like Patrick Mahomes, he had such a good first half, which he just played really well, and then it just seemed like he just couldn't really get anything materialized. The Bengals' defense really started to pick it up and like pressure him a little bit. One thing I think they need to do for the Super Bowl is definitely work on their linebackers. Kind of like if there's if Patrick Mahomes is scrambling, their linebackers got to come up and give him and you know get some pressure on him because there's a lot of times where he was able to scramble and you know get two or three yards after you know the pocket collapsing and some linemen chasing after him. Patrick Mahomes is going to outrun every lineman that comes across him. you got to have the linebackers come in and take it. And my dad was talking to me about that, too. He was, like, getting really mad about it. I was like, I mean, but they won. So it wasn't too big a deal. But when it came down to it, Bengals came out, came in hard. That was pretty great to see. During that second half, um, especially on that final drive where they were forced to take that field goal, Mm -hmm. Mahomes' decision-making was suspect. Yeah, Yeah, it was not good. It was. Especially especially on that um, last drive to get the field goal. They were set up, what, in 10, 25, they were in the red zone. And instead of just throwing it away, taking a couple yards, he is rushing back and forth in the pocket and trying to find a receiver open. And instead of just saving time, he just he takes a sack and yeah. backs, backs him up uh, 10 yards, around yeah. 10 yards. Yeah. Almost fumbled it too. Yeah, he. Uh, yeah, that's. Yeah, I think they right label it seventeen yards. Seventeen yards. He 17 lost yard seventeen loss? yards Holy on the crap. sack. Well, it was fifteen, and then the fumbled two more. But seventeen yeah, yard yeah. loss on third and goal at the nine. It's ridiculous. At the nine. Yeah. Um. That especially in a lot of those situations, you you'd expect uh, Mahomes to dump it off to Kelsey. Yeah, Kelsey just, just finds finds a weird way to get open, yeah, especially like in Kelsey's situations down like that. Very often, <laughs> and it was it was one of the reasons they got down there that quick is because he had Kelsey and he was just hitting his his receivers, and then it just comes to a halt. And like Joe said, that Bengals defense showed up in the yes. second half. That was huge for them. Um, it, it, it it an exact replica almost of um, when they met in the regular season. It's exactly how you could have wanted it to go. Um, as somebody who works with, or like for somebody who works in NFL ratings, that game was perfect for them. Yes, it really was. I mean, the fact of the way that this game went, you were like, there's no way that it happens again when the Bengals beat the Chiefs. You're like, no, it doesn't happen again. I even said it. I thought that when this game started, I was like, oh, yeah, but the secondary wasn't ready. Because, I mean, you go up to this game and you played Oakland. What's their pass offense? Not very good. You go play Tennessee. Yeah, it's run Henry to the ground until they he actually until breaks Tana one. Until Tannehill throws an interception. Yeah, so he throws three interceptions. So you're like, is this going to be... Because like, they're not used to it. And then they come out and they score 21 points. I was like, oh, all right. Now I, I feel pretty good about myself. Like, I, I'm not, I got made the call. And then the second half happens. I'm like, oh, my gosh. This Bengals is secondary. Oh my gosh, they're pressuring. What? Whoa, this defense is actually playing for something, it seems like. They're not just trying to ride Joe Burrow train all the way through, which, I mean, not a bad train to ride on, but I mean, when the defense is helping, I mean, this team is incredible. I got to give credit to this Bengals defense because they were the number one reason that I was not like, yeah, Bengals is a Super Bowl contender. I don't see it. And that was the reason why. The offense is great. I mean, we've seen what T. Higgins, Tyler Boyd, and Jamar Chase can do, especially with Joe Mixon in the backfield. Like, this this offense was great. It really sucked to see Azuma go down early in that game because he's a pivotal piece in there. But, I mean, having other guys as well, like Perrine, that really can bring a spark. And, I mean, really, the fact that this team made it this far, I think has really changed how teams now are going to view the entirety of a rebuild. Because the fact of it is, is a lot of teams are looking at their where they are as far as rebuilding is concerned. 
And, I mean, you got a guy like Zach Taylor that really s- started this position in 19, and people were like, oh, my gosh, this is this is over. Like, this guy's awful. I mean, he went 6-25 and 25 in his first two years. In this, in this era, like, if he would have did this almost a year later, he's fired. From what we've seen already from these last, like, Brian, the, the fact is you would have fired Zach Taylor two years ago way faster than Brian Flores. No question about it, right? Oh, no. But they trusted him. They got Burrow. And this, this snap is put together, one of the best seasons that we've seen. And now, I mean, they're going to the Super Bowl. I mean, that just really puts in mind, like, you have to trust the process, and it's going to be gross. But it's when cr- you have the right pieces, it's going to work. It's crazy that three years ago, they were last in the league. Like yep. that, oh, yeah. Yep. That, that they made that turnaround that and, fast, and they made all the right decisions, like, it's like one in a million. You never see this. Like, I don't think that there's ever been a time across any major sport that, like, a team has gone from literally the worst to playing on the biggest stage, like, less than five years later. Like, I don't think it's ever happened before. No. I think you have to argue that Jamar Chase over Panay Sewell was the perfect pick for both franchises. I think so, yeah. I think, yeah. Because if it's the other way okay. around, I mean, I, this team, just f- speculation on paper looks like. Like I would say, like an eight nine team. Yeah, yeah. they're they're like average Joes. It's it would be, almost it would be like, like a. It's like a. Win, it's good that like we have Pen, or that the Alliance have Panay Suell and that they have Jamar Chase. But I mean, yeah, if yeah. like you switch around, it still would be fine. Like their off Bengals offensive line would be that much better. Like he probably wouldn't be pressured as much, and we'd have a, a receiver to. But you gotta admit the same round. But I mean, still Jer- Jared Goff to. Jamar Chase is not the same as Joe Burrow to Jamar Chase. Oh, yeah. I yeah. mean, they have... The stats would be completely I think that's, I think that's, I think that's why they chose him, is yeah. because, like, they already had that connection. They already had that chemistry being from LSU. They have not lost a play... I mean, I'm not going to say anything too soon. Oof. I'll probably knock on wood after <laughs> yeah. this. But there's a stat line that said they have not lost a playoff game uh, in LSU or in the... Uh, or they have not lost a playoff game together in both the NFL and college. Nope. And now... There it is. Now he's gonna have to do it again. I'm not sure if that door's wood. I'm not gonna lie. Close enough. It looks like wood. It's painted wood. Yeah, it makes it's it's good enough. But I mean, this is crazy. I mean, just to put it all in perspective, how many people picked the Bengals at the beginning of the year to win the Super Bowl? Not a lot. Not many. Not many. And look where they are. And San Francisco almost got there, but they ran into our friend Matthew Stafford, who has delivered the Rams a chance for a home field. Super Bowl. He's got the the Rams have the city of Detroit behind them. We got Matthew Stafford playing. We got Eminem at halftime. It's like it's just Detroit in in, in Los Angeles. So that's basically it. I mean, he's gonna have the whole. If you're a Lions fan and you're not rooting for the Rams, I don't know what you're doing. Like, yeah, that's just the one thing. It's like Stafford to win this would basically shut up all those haters that he's had since the start of his career, saying. He's not actually a good quarterback. It's just he's been playing around so many bad people that he looks incredible. And it's like, no, he's a guy who's able to lead them to that point. Don't even look at me like that, Dylan. Don't even look at me like that. He's a he's a Hall of Famer. He he's is. A, he he's is. a Hall of Famer and arguably one of the best quarterbacks to ever play the game. Oh, he is for sure. However, for this season, Matt Stafford concerns me as as good as he is on this Rams team, and he has great receivers. He has Odell. He has Cup. Um, he's got a defense around him that is going to make noise and could possibly disrupt and bring out that concern about the Bengals' mm-hmm. online. He has been the best, and but the, my biggest concern for the Rams. Um, his he he's he's been pick prone, and I, that really came out against the Titans in the regular season, where they lost. Um, pretty it, it was embarrassing yeah for it them. wasn't great it wasn't was great, great. Um, it, it's it's been uh, red zone interceptions mm-hmm. with Stafford and that can be a make or break thing it's been coming down to the wire it came down to the wire against San Francisco where they just escaped uh, on a field goal you can't afford that going against Joe Burrow in the Super Bowl yeah, and I, I, I like the point that you made because I think a lot of people, I mean, analysts can certainly say this, like, we love Matthew Stafford. He's top 10 quarterback in almost every book, in any analyst book across the NFL. There's no question about it. What he has shown this year 
is that he's not afraid to sling it. And where did he get that tendency from, right? Detroit. Exactly. So the fact is, it's like the natural instinct is you got to force it because back in Detroit, it was like the interception is not going it's, to, it's, it's not going to do anything, right? It's like just as good as a punt, basically, for what our defense was early on in the 2010s to 2014s because you got to admit the defense was good. Mm-hmm. So, that, but now it's almost like the last couple of years, it's been like, all right. Dude, just make the throw. I mean, your best chance is for to make that risk throw and it get through, and we make a big play rather than just actually playing fundamental football, right? That's how it, that's how it's really been for him. But I mean, the fact is, is he's still kind of playing that way. But like sometimes he doesn't have to play that way anymore, right? Because I mean, a, we, see, we saw what this defense did in the fourth quarter, right? I mean, they were locked down. They I mean, were it's a awesome. habit. It's a habit that he's been developing since you know the start of his career, which is not right. like the easiest thing to break because. I mean, yeah, I'll say that he has been pick prone, like basically the his whole career. Like he throws, I'd say, a, a good amount more than everybody else. But like you said, it's because in the line or when he's playing for Lions, it's like, oh well, if I throw a pick that's twenty yards down the field, it's going to be the same thing as if we pump because they're going to get a twenty yard return anyways. However, I think the thing too is he makes almost two or three no look passes a game. Oh yeah, that that's a big thing. However, more often than not, though, that's something that you know, defenses aren't expecting. And that's something that he can pull out of his pocket when he needs to. And I think, yeah, that's one thing he does use it a little bit too much. I don't like it's sick for when you want to put up a highlight reel and you want to make an Instagram post for the sport or for Sports Center or whatever. You want to say like, oh my gosh, how does he do this? But when it comes down to it, there's a lot of times where he does mess up. However, I think when you look at it, especially in this Super Bowl, and you need a guy if it comes down to the point where you know they need a last second drive, or you know there's a minute left, or he's hurt, or he needs to really bring this team together, the grit that he has and the amount of leadership qualities that he has to bring this team from the depths, if need be, I don't want anyone else other than Matt Stafford in that position if they need to go down the field with a minute, or if he needs to go down, put his head down, and barrel over a guy to get a, a two point or a two yard uh, run to get the first down or something like that. There's nobody else that I would want for the Rams. And if you're a Rams fan, there's nobody else that you want to lead your team than Matt Stafford right now, especially going to the Super Bowl. Because he wants this. The Aaron Donald wants this. The whole city of Detroit wants this. And I can definitely tell you that Matt Stafford is not going to stop this game. He, he'll get, he's going to dislocate his shoulder or he'll get injured, but he's not going to stop. He's going to want that ring. He's going to do everything he can to get it. I totally agree, but I'll say this though, and just in general, not Matt Stafford. Yeah. If the Rams want to get that Super Bowl ring and get Matty Staff a, a ring and Aaron Donald a ring and Ramsey a ring and all these guys a ring that have absolutely every tool they need to get a ring there, mm-hmm. they need to clean up the mistakes. Yes. As it, yeah. The, the red zone picks from Stafford, um, you saw it a lot in the Buccaneers Rams game uh, a week ago. Um, and we're not when that's including even the tart drop. That the tart drop changed too. Yeah, the whole entire that entire game thing almost. right there. That that's rough for them. Um, yeah, when he heaved that down the field, I was like, mm, that's a little bit too much time. Yeah, when I saw, especially when he panned, I was like, this getting picked, it's game over. But yeah. he just like. He ain't gonna have a job next year. <laughs> Poor man. <laughs> he he yeah. in the he in the owner's office right now is getting chewed out. And he's like, yeah, you're out of here. Yeah, uh, it's tough for them. But no, Dylan, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's been what's been the weakness of this team, right? Offense, no, no. It's they just... got a creative play caller and all the pieces. Defense, no. They got a juggernaut pass rush with an elite secondary. What's the problem? Mistakes. I, I would turnovers. Say, say either. Uh, that mistakes that come from uh, putting a dependency on either the offense or the defense, and not just having a balanced game throughout. Yeah, I mean, there's times there's times where Jalen Ramsey kind of like overcommits one way or the other. Like he kind of plays it so that way he'll either go full out for the interception or just kind of stay back. And there's times where he gets kind of beat off the line a little bit, kind of doing that. I mean, he's I, he's the best corner in the league, but still he makes those mistakes. I mean, once or twice a game, and you know one or two mistakes a game is like something that a lot of owners and a lot of coaches are thinking like that's a great player but you know when are those going to come and I think when you have it where you know Von Miller might not be playing super good and they're doubling Aaron Donald then what's going to happen for that pass rush uh and that you know making it so that way they have to get Joe Burrow to scramble out of the pocket which is going to be tough for them and I mean like you said with Matt Stafford if he throws picks and that's going to be tough but you know I think that they're going to be able to do it especially seeing how bad the offensive line for the Bengals is even if they double Aaron Donald, I think Von Miller is going to be able to squeeze through. There's, Their linebackers are so much better than what uh, the Chiefs had, I think. And I think it's just going to be 
the defense of the Rams is good enough to, even if they have a bad day, be able to just stomp all over the offensive line. Oh, for sure. Um, the, the Rams' pass rush is arguably one of the best in the league, if not the Absolutely best. Absolutely ridiculous. Um, and that right there can break that um, connection between Jamar and uh, Burrow and make sure he has no time to throw all mm-hmm. the way downfield. Because it's going to be, it's gonna be Jamar having to do short routes the whole time if it, if it keeps collapsing. It, yeah. It's all about that contain mm-hmm. right there. So uh, they definitely have a chance. Um, I hope Stafford wins it. I hope Donald wins it. That entire team, arguably two of the most likable teams in the league. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, so. especially it's just like what everybody right everybody wanted at the start. Yes. Like, yes, at the start of the playoffs, everyone was just like, "We want either a Bills, bang, like a Bills to make it, Bengals to make it, or the Rams to make it." Yeah, and then you could probably. Be, I think uh, people wanted the Packers to make it in just because the Rodgers. Yeah, stuff. the, the yeah. last. Yeah, dance. that would be probably the other NFC team. Nobody wants Dallas in it. Nobody, no, nobody wanted wants Tampa Dallas. Bay in it. Nobody, nobody wanted City. the Chiefs in it. Like those teams just went too much, you know. So no, this is gonna be a very likable Super Bowl. I think that's that's a very fair statement. I mean, great. As a, as a Steelers fan, I feel like dirty for like not feeling <laughs> feeling <laughs> hurt that <laughs> the Bengals made it. Yeah. Um, but. Joe Burrow is just so likable. Oh, He's yeah. such a cool guy. Him and his Cartier buffs yeah. in the press or conferences. Pink glasses on, everything. Yes. Smoking this cigar. He's such a likable guy, and he's so talented. And it's it's always nice to see that uh, come back, especially after the knee injury he had. Yeah. It just feels wrong for me to want to like to be able to like these guys. Yeah, you, as much as you don't want to like him, you have to. Like, you got to respect him. Yeah, yeah, you got to respect him nonetheless. Yeah, and he, not fake jewelry, guys. Come on. He's Joe no, Burrow. No he he's makes got the way too much money. Why did the reporters ask that question? Fake? Are those fake? He and Ocho Cinco. Who's yeah, <laughs> his response was perfect. I'm Joe Burrow. You think I had four fake? <laughs> I have paid <laughs> for real, too much <laughs> to have fakes. Yeah, well, I have too much. That's just so funny. It's fun. Joe Burrow is a likable guy. Going to be a great Super Bowl, but... One thing that definitely came across this weekend that I think nobody expected outside possibly the Bengals and Rams meeting was the retirement, in quotation marks, Question mark. of Tom alleged, Brady. Alleged retirement. Okay, so we have the story kind of put out that there was a leak from Adam Schefter and apparently some other sources. I didn't hear the names of some of the other ones that said Tom Brady is going to hang up his cleats. He's done. He's retiring. Make it effective today. And you literally go on Twitter, you can't see anything but just straight Tom Brady stuff across the board in sports reporting, right? Cause exactly. I, but now they come back and they say, wait, Tom well, didn't say this. Wait a minute. He's Some not retired right. yet. Even Tom comes out and with his agent and says, yeah, he's not He's not ready. You'll hear it from him. you are not hear it from anybody else. Yeah. Tom, Tom hasn't said anything. He hasn't made a statement on it. He, right. He was like, his his agent, Don, says uh, yeah. he'll say it. When, when, I saw, right. when I saw that, like, and it was like per Adam Schefter, I was like, I saw it and I was like, dude, Tom Brady is the guy, is not the guy who will let that leak out. No. Like, he's definitely a guy who's going to cover all his bases and then make a press conference or release it himself and say, I'm retiring. I'm going to hang up the cleats. And he's also a guy who's not going st- to, who's, I think he wants to do a Peyton Manning where he's going to win a Super Bowl and then he's going to be done because he definitely has talent. Guy throws 45 touchdowns this season at 44. He's got plenty of time left. He's got the talent. He's got the team around him. I mean, A.B. isn't there anymore, but I mean, <laughs> you know how it is. But, like, he's a guy who still has – he's not in his prime anymore, at, like, athletically, but mentally and as a, as a quarterback, he still is a guy who can get you a Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. One or two more Super Bowls if he really wanted to. And I think that's the one thing is, like, when I saw that, I was super skeptical because I was like, he's not the guy who would let this happen where it'll just leak out and it'll be in, in question. Yeah, I think the the matter of fact of, like when we saw this, we were all kind of like, huh, that's kind of like, I Are guess you it's, sure about it's that? over. But nobody, no, like everybody was kind of like, oh, wow, this is such a surprise. But it was like, wait, it's a surprise, right? Because we don't, we don't expect it to go that way. Tom Brady's retirement, the greatest player in football, greatest player arguably in NFL history across the board, just hangs it up on a January 30th afternoon at like 2 p.m. 
No, there's no way. By a leak? No, absolutely not. There's just something that's going on with this, and I know that we'll get into the speculation in just a minute. Dylan has an awesome theory for how this is all going to how it transpired, but the fact is, like, Tom Brady is too much of a just a like the human touch of a person. Like, there, he's so likable. Like, now I mean, obviously, people hate him because he wins all the time, but that's a different point. But you know, like he's not necessarily like he's he he's a he's such a like humane guy that you're there's like just no way that you just like let the opportunity to take all like as great of a player he is there's no way he'd just like let this go by right there's got to be something behind it that makes it that super special right the human touch especially with all the things that he said about his family all the things that he said leading up to I want to play till I'm 45 years old which I mean he's almost there. So, I mean, the fact is, like, there seems to be more to this. And I, I was listening to uh, Dave Sampson this morning from CBS that was saying that exact same thing of, like, you know, if Tom wanted to retire, that's not the way Tom wants it to go. Yeah. You know, there's got to be something more to it. There's got to be some just, like, there's got to be, a, like, an aura around it. Like, there, there has to be something spectacular to come out of it. And, I mean, just the fact that it gets leaked, it doesn't make sense. But the theory is going to be theories behind it. The way that this leaked, somebody was in the circle of whoever was talking to him, got a hold of some information, and tried to become the next Schefter. That, I think that has to be what has happened in this situation. But, I mean, Dylan, your conspiracy theory that you have found out, I think, is very interesting. Why don't you tell us? So this theory makes more sense than anything. Um, on the whole, not doing a, a whole big thing. One of the winningest quarterback in NFL history just says, "Yeah, I'm done." No, no way. No. Um, on on top of the fact, if if Tom Brady is still on the roster uh, by this Friday, he gets another fifteen million dollars. So he's not going to retire before he gets that fifteen mil, right? Um, however, this was posited by uh, Toucher and Riches of Boston Sports Show, and it, it reads like this. So Tom Brady recorded his T's final episode of Man in the Arena where he announces his retirement. And this is speculation. That's not known. But So let's say he does that. And then someone at ESPN+, Plus, the network that carries the series, sees an advanced copy of it. And then that person leaks it to fellow employee Adam Schefter. Mm. And that's that makes more sense when you realize that ESPN is standing by the story of Tom Brady's retirement. The NFL, the act like their Instagram account posted the retirement of Tom Brady. It says Tom Brady hangs it up and has his retirement, and all these guys, Julian Edelman, Bucks players, come out and thank Tom Brady for playing or having played with him or being the goat. So all yeah. these insiders that are going to know if Brady is retiring, and then now it's just like, no, oh, we don't, we don't know, we don't know. And it's he, he's just going to build up for Man in the Arena. His, he's It's literally all leading up to that final episode where it can drive traffic. That's true. To drive show. ratings up a little bit. And that'll This entire thing, it, it's perfectly orchestrated because everyone's talking about, is Tom Brady retiring? There's no doubt he is. This is it for him. He's It's more than usual Tom Brady in more than past years, it's been talked about, is he retiring this year? That's what's been posted. He goes on, he talks about it, and he's like, uh, yeah, you know, his his wife not liking seeing him get hit and family time and all mm-hmm. this. Um, I've never heard that come out of Tom Brady's mouth. I mean, after he wins the Super Bowl, he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm coming back. You just won. You're going to come back. But th- this like legitimate, like somber idea of, yeah, um, I'm getting up there in age. And then it starts coming out that people close to Tom start saying they're expecting him to retire. They think he's going to retire. He's going to make a decision on retirement. And then the next couple of days, Adam Schefter releases his report. And then it gets walked back on to create a little bit of controversy. People start talking about it. It'll just lead up to the man in the arena, drive up all that rating he'll collect his cool 15 mil from the buccaneers and he will ride off into the sunset as the winningest quarterback in nfl history i'm not a conspiracy theorist 
But doesn't that just make sense? It kind of does. I mean, I think Adam Schefter kind of maybe. I don't know. I've. I thought he jumped the gun a little bit, but I don't, yeah. now that I think about it a lot more, like it sucks. That I don't want to see him retire because then, like, you know, all of our childhood quarterbacks growing up are just like not playing anymore, and it just like kind of signifies a new era of like franchise and you know generational players and stuff like that. But the more I think about him, I'm just like you know, it makes sense because he's a guy like. You know how how oft, how long is he going to be able to like hold this up? You know he's getting older. Yeah. I feel like I feel like what he says though when he gets hit and stuff and when he gets like some small injuries, it probably takes a lot longer for him to heal up and get back to 100 oh, yeah. percent now. And I mean I even remember when <clears throat> when you made that point of like Giselle getting worried about him getting hit and stuff like that. I mean guy's a family man. He probably wants to start being a dad a lot more. So it makes a lot more sense, but hopefully it's not true because I'd like to see him win one more before he calls it quits. I wish or I wish he'd be able to win eight, but I mean, hey, 20 years and you make the Super Bowl 10 times and you win seven of them, I mean, that's crazy. Are we ever going to see that again? Probably, like, uh, probably yeah. not. It's, probably not. It's yeah. it's crazy to think about. Wait, who's gonna be who's gonna be that guy? The only person I can think of is maybe like Patrick Mahomes, maybe. 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 But homie's, what, one and three in the Super Bowl right now? Yeah, but I mean, he just got beat by Joe Burrow. And then there's other guys, you know, Justin Herbert. Or one and two. Yeah, one and two. One and two. Sorry. He's 50%. I I meant to say one for three. I meant to say one for three. He's won 50% of the Super Bowls. That's an excellent... Has he made two or three? He's made two. Right? Wait. I thought he's made three. Because he... No. Because he made... He lost one. He made one before... Oh, I guess two. Yeah, yeah you're right. two. Yeah. Never mind. I just don't know what I'm he talking about. He won the one against San Francisco and then lost to Tom Brady and the Buccaneers. Oh, okay. Correct. I thought he played one more before the... I no. thought. Oh, because it was San Francisco and the Rams that yeah. one time. I thought it was uh, Rams and the Chiefs. Never mind. Yeah. I mean, uh, either way, like, the fact that you... We, I think what we all kind of thought... Because, I mean, it was pretty obvious, like, Tom Brady was like, yeah, I'm not retiring. Like, he said that so many times throughout this. I'm playing until I'm 45 and all of these other things. Like, you were just like, yeah, there, there's no way that, like, Tom's going to retire or anything. But now when you started, when we started hearing about, like, he's talking about Giselle more. He's talking about his kids more. Yeah. He's talking about, like, I mean, I started, and he actually starts admitting stuff and you're like, oh, this really seems like this is it, isn't it? That That's the exact point I was about to make. Nobody, nobody talks about or no one had talked about retirement with Tom Brady. Those two terms do not collide. You have a quarterback like Big Ben. Three years ago, they're asking, uh, is this dude going to retire yet? Is he? Because is <laughs> you can tell, he's literally, yeah. he looks like he's getting old. Tom Brady has been as physically fit for the game of football as he has in years. He's been really good with his health. Big Ben should have probably retired two years ago, and that's what has been talked about. Big Ben in retirement... Perfect combination. Tom Brady and retirement don't go together. Antithesis of each other. Mm-hmm. But now you have him talking about retirement, just kind of edging around it, and then you have his agent edging around it. And I hate to repeat myself, but that whole idea of bringing it to the man in the arena and having a, like imagine it comes out Tom Brady announces his retirement in this show everyone's going to want to go watch that final episode or the yeah. entire series yeah. it's perfect his dad can say yeah he's not retiring you were literally his dad <laughs> you know the answer it's like my mom saying i'm the best journalist ever <laughs> <laughs> yes no i i agree and that was one of the things dave sampson said too is like when they were talking about yo like his dad said he, tom knows what he's going to do right He's not. Is he actually waiting this out? I mean, he's had how many years that he's been thinking about this, right? He was thinking about this. Like, we should be honest. Before he came to Tampa, these rumors were just as hot as any. Like, oh yeah, he's not going to play for another team, right? No, no way. Just trying to make an honest dollar. He knows what he wanted to do in Tampa. Tom Brady is a certified bag chaser. (laughs) <laughs> Up until the very end, he is going to be a certified bag chaser. Yeah, which, I mean, it kind of sucks. It makes no sense. Because he won't get all the money from, like, man in the <clears> arena. <throat> It'll partially go to ESPN, but, man, I mean. I mean, homie, homie's wife probably sitting on a, a quick little bag. I mean, well, I mean she, Giselle she's, makes more than she, Tom does. Yeah, she makes it more than him probably, like, five times over, most yeah. likely. I mean, when she was, like, getting, or when she was like in her prime of modeling or whatever, she was probably making, like, what, $100 million, $200 million bucks a year? Oh, got to be up there. This is completely random. Um, but Tom Brady's wife Giselle, right? Yeah. Did you know that uh, she was used to? She used to be married to Leonardo DiCaprio. Really? Yeah. 
Bro, maybe she's bag chasing, dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. That's just a fun fact that That's I That's funny. That is a fun fact. Leonardo DiCaprio probably dumped her when she reached 22. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. I, fans are pretty mad at Giselle because I think they think that she's behind all of this. But, I mean, I mean Tom's a family man, it's, though. He's, he's 44 years old. That's the, yeah, yeah, that's dude. the thing. It's like, I think when, when you see Tom Brady who said, like, I want to play till I'm 50 or 45 or whatever, then, like, you hear all this stuff about her. His, like, that's just what his, like... That's what every NFL player's wife probably says. That's what every NFL fa- player's family probably says. Is like they don't want their, you know, they don't want the next game to be like a terrible hit or like a, a career ending. They don't want to have no. it like an Alex Smith type situation where his leg is literally just like severed, and severed yeah. apart, and now it just looks like a you know a, a poorly packed like sausage. Like that's I mean, basically what his leg looks like. So you don't want that to happen to Tom Brady, but it's like. You also don't want him to retire because he has so many fans across the board and he has so many people who just don't want to see him stop playing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, last year Tom Brady had a he played on a like torn MCL. Yeah. Or something he had to get it repaired in the offseason. And to my knowledge, um that is like the worst injury Tom has had in a while. Mm-hmm. And that, it, it's like a, a a crack in in that like or just a, a tear yeah. in the curtain, right? He's not yeah. invincible. He's not invincible. He's he's forty four years but old. But it let's, could let's... it could snowball into just like yeah. a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, Be, yeah being stuff. being surprised, um, uh, Tom Brady retires around forty four, forty five. You shouldn't be surprised. It, it's like having someone die when they're one hundred and one years old. It's bound to happen yeah. at this rate. I think it's more like with people. I think it's more like people think like he's gonna play. Like they have that thought. It's just like. We know he's going to retire, but, like, the people think he's going to play forever. And then when it actually comes to it, they're just like, wow, like, can't believe it actually happened. The epiphany that Tom Brady will not play on a football field is too much for people to let go by. You know? Yeah. That's that's really what I think it comes down to. We know that Tom Brady will retire. We just don't want it to happen. You know? Yeah. We want to see him play. But what a career forever. for Mr. 199. If it is the end for Brady, who knows? Maybe he comes back and win another Super Bowl, but... It'll be very interesting to see how this offseason goes to see, in fact, if you will be on the football field in 2022 coming up. But thank you guys for tuning in. We appreciate your listen to this episode. Make sure you follow and subscribe on whatever podcast platform you are on. Include subscribe to YouTube for all the best and full show bits of the MVSP, as well as all the other goodness. But Dylan, thank you for joining us, my friend. Anytime. Yeah, great to have you on, Dylan. But as always, take care, everybody.